Well, have you been as obsessed as I have been with the Olympics? Like, I've been way more obsessed than I expected to be. I mean, I really didn't think I was going to care a whole lot. And, but for you, what has been the best part so far? Like, I've got a few thoughts, like, like this picture right here that I have. This is, it's coming. This is Katie Ledecky. <clears throat> This is at the end of the 1500 meter freestyle. Just wrap your head around that. I know we're in America, so we don't use the metric system. That's like a mile in a pool, right? So that's after a mile, and she won the gold medal, setting a new Olympic record. And just look at the picture. She was so far ahead, there's nobody else in the screen. <laughs> this was her eighth gold medal in any Olympic Games, which was a record for any American woman. And then the next picture is her after she won yesterday the 800 meter freestyle, her ninth gold medal, her fourth gold medal in this, this event alone. She won it for the first time when she was 15 years old. That's amazing, right? Or, or maybe you, you were thinking about something like this. Do you know who this, this is in the next picture? You probably do at this point. This is Steven Nedarashik, I think is how you say it. And he is part of the US men's gymnastics team. And this was him as the team was going into the sixth and final rotation. Go back. Because he, he looked totally checked out, didn't he? But this was him dialed in. See, he's on the team and he's been sitting there for two hours doing nothing because the only reason he's on the team is he is a specialist in one event, the pommel horse, which is what the next picture is showing if you don't know what a pommel horse is. It's that one where you know their legs are flying all around looking like a helicopter and all those sorts of things, right? As the team entered the sixth and final rotation, the Americans were actually over six points out of the medals. The first guys on the team had incredible routines for them, and up comes Steven. Maybe I'm partial to him because he's also an engineer, and so like I have this kindred <laughs> spirit with him, but it really was coming down to him. And he's been sitting there for over two hours doing nothing but getting water for his teammates. And he gets up there and he nails the routine. 14.866 is what he scored, enough to secure the bronze medal the first time the US men's gymnastics team has won a medal in the Olympics for 16 years. And the whole team, they were incredible. Next picture is just them so excited, celebrating. What an amazing moment. And there's probably lots of others that you might think of. You might be like, well, you didn't mention the women's gymnastics team. You're right. You didn't mention equestrian dressage. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> you didn't mention field hockey or handball or rugby or soccer. You're right. And if you're thinking about all of those moments that you're like, but this was the best part, then you're in the right frame of mind for today's message. Because today, we are talking about something as natural and simple as sharing your favorite part of the Olympic Games. But sometimes we make it more complicated than it needs to be. This is the next message in our sermon series for this summer called the ABCs of Churchy Words. And churchy words, that's my phrase, those are those words that maybe you only hear in church or when you're reading the Bible, words that may be completely unfamiliar to you or Maybe words that you're familiar with, but when you really think about it, maybe you don't really fully understand what they mean, or maybe even more importantly, why do they matter? And so each week we're looking at a different word, and so we've looked at A for assurance, and B for blessing, and C for consecration, and so today is D. E. e. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I fooled you. <laughs> We're not going to do all 26 letters. That would take us till after Christmas. And so, you know, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Today, we're skipping to E. And so E is for evangelism. And so we're going to talk about this looking at John chapter 1. And if you want, you can follow along on the screen. Or if you brought your Bible with you, feel free to open it. We're going to start in verse 35. But let's listen to God's word together this morning. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. 
Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, in these moments, may you give us all that we need to hear well from you. May you break down the places of resistance, the places uh, of hard-heartedness, places of misunderstanding. And may you lead us and shape us into the people that you have made us to be. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So when I said today was about evangelism, how did you feel? What did you think? A few might have been like, yes, fantastic. Others might have been like, I don't really have any idea what you mean, which is fine. And others, maybe even most, were kind of like, ugh, I don't really want to talk about that. Can we, can we talk about something else? I'm sure E has lots of other good options. And I think part of that feeling may come from a deep misunderstanding of what we're really talking about. Because for many, I think, especially in the world today, when we hear the word evangelism or you hear the word evangelical, which is related to it, someone who is likely to participate in evangelism, do you start thinking about politics? And if so, that's not what evangelism is about. Evangelism is not about a political party. It's not about gaining political influence and power to sway public policy or elections. Not that I actually have a problem with Christians in politics. I desperately want more people who have the values of the kingdom of God participating deeply in all facets of our governance and our life. We desperately need it. But political evangelicalism has often stood out more for what it is against than what it's for. And when the Bible talks about evangelism, it is deeply about what we are for because evangelism is all about Jesus. And Jesus is all about people. And evangelism is all about people. So what is evangelism? Evangelism is simply the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, proclamation may be like, one of those churchy words, you may be like, I don't really know what that means, so let's just try a few other possible alternatives. How about the sharing, the speaking, the announcing, the declaring, the good news of Jesus Christ? And this is what we saw multiple people doing in the passage that we read this morning. It's what John the Baptist was doing right at the very beginning where we see, and John the Baptist has lots of influence and power, but he uses his influence to point to Jesus, because that's what evangelism fundamentally does. It points to Jesus. He's there with two of his disciples. Jesus comes walking along, and he says, look, the Lamb of God. That was evangelism. And you may be like, well, no, that can't be. That's, that's too simple. Well, evangelism can be very simple. We often are the ones that complicate it. Because the goal of evangelism is to point to Jesus so that someone who doesn't know Jesus has the opportunity to see, to hear, to know Jesus, to put their trust in Jesus, and to follow him. It doesn't have to be complicated. We're just trying to help people know Jesus. And so John has practiced evangelism by simply saying, look. But 
it's also a very profound message he has given. In those few words, there was packed so much meaning and significance that was incredibly relevant to those disciples of John, especially in that day. Because he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, when you think of the word lamb, what comes to mind? I mean, you might think of, you know, that fluffy, cuddly little animal or a stuffed animal, some peaceful little thing. And that's fine, but that's not at all what these disciples would have been thinking of, right? In their very Jewish mindset, they would have been thinking about the temple. They would have been thinking about the issue of how we as selfish and sinful humans can relate to a holy, a good, and almighty God. And they understood that lambs were offered as a sacrifice so that they could approach God and have a relationship with Him. Right? See, they had an understanding of sin, that sin was so much more than just the mistakes that they made in their life. Sin was so much more than just the, the brokenness that generally people experience. They understood that sin put a fundamental divide between them and God, their creator. Because God, who in his perfection, his goodness, his beauty, his majesty, his glory, his holiness, lots of really beautiful churchy words. In the fullness of who God is, they knew that their sin had separated them from him. And I think we as humans today carry that general sense of the otherness and the awesomeness of God. We often carry a sense of our own inadequacy, our own failure. And we wonder, we wonder where does that leave us? And I think all of that is tied up with the reality of our experience of sin. But here's the good news. God had made a way for his people to be in a relationship with him. And that way was to take a lamb and offer it as a sacrifice in the temple because that lamb would experience the death that they deserved so that they could instead have life and relationship with God. And so Jesus walks by, and in this one little phrase, John the Baptist says, look, the lamb of God, the one who can finally take away all of our sin, the one who can finally repair our relationship that's broken, the divide that we have from God, our creator, the one who can not just deal with the outward consequences of our sin, but can cleanse our soul and make us pleasing and acceptable and lovable to God. Look, the lamb of God. You know, evangelism can be simple, but it is also profound even in its simplicity. And it is deep and it is true and it is based on what Jesus has done for us. But I think we struggle with evangelism for a lot of reasons. And I want to deal with one up front because it seems to be growing this, this reason it's actually come out through a research group. Barna Research Group does a lot of cultural studies and looks at trends in, in culture and in the church. And in a recent study, the Barna Group discovered that about half of committed Christians, self-professed Christians, actually agree or somewhat agree with the statement that it is wrong to share your personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share your same faith. In other words, about half of committed Christians believe that it is morally wrong to participate in evangelism. Why would that be? I think part of it is because we live in an increasingly pluralistic society. And what I mean by that is that we are constantly interacting with more and more people who have different worldviews, different religious convictions, different beliefs, and there is a ton of pressure from the greatest, perhaps, worldview that we share, ton of pressure to say, you know what, let everyone have their own way, their own understanding, their own path, because they're all good. But is that right? Are they all good? Is it true? Because it seems to me there is a real problem with 
these other paths. And the problem with these other religions and non-religions that are really functioning as religions because they demand the same kind of loyalty and zeal, but the problem with these other paths is that they have no lamb. All the other paths that I'm aware of say something like this. Follow this path. Follow the rules. Do these behaviors. And if you do them well enough, then you will be acceptable. You will be good enough. Then things will work out for you. But here's the question. At the end of that road, of all of those paths, they end with one question. How good is good enough? And have I been it? And yet so many people appeal to the thought, the idea that, well, I'm a good person. It's going to be okay. But are we really good enough? See, I think my concern with all of those systems and this persistent thought or this insistence that all the systems are the same is that there's no lamb. And so within each of those systems of faith, of worldview, of belief, or even non-belief, is this deep idea that it's all about your effort and your goodness. And if you're good enough, you'll be rewarded. And if you're not, tough luck. But what if, what if sin really is that bad? What if there really is a chasm between us and God that is so great that there is not good enough within me to overcome all of the rest that is within me? What if the gap from our past and our regrets and our failures that we cannot even undo is so significant that I cannot be pleasing to God on my own, that I am not lovable on my own merits? What if that's true and what if there is no lamb? See, we need a lamb. And so do the other people in our lives. And we know this is true from other other spheres of our life. You've probably had an experience something like this where you were talking to a friend or a colleague and they're sharing with you some of the things that they're going through, pain that they're experiencing or symptoms of an ailment or something. And, And it makes you go, you know what? That sounds an awful lot like what my cousin was going through and they went to this doctor and they started getting treated and now the symptoms are gone they've been relieved they they feel great you should go talk to that doctor and we freely and openly will tell everyone because we know that this is good news for them they may not take it but we know that it's good news because that other person could find relief and healing. And so we can wax eloquent about our orthopedic surgeons. But Jesus is the great physician, the one who wants to offer healing at a deeper level than any medicine or medical doctor could even imagine or touch. I mean, it's not wrong to share when doctors can help heal and get well. What if Jesus wants to help people get well? So they don't have to be crushed by the lives of anxiety, of wondering, am I good enough of having to carry the weight of shame and guilt and regret on their own shoulders? Here's the thing. We have news. There's a lamb that wants to take it all away. A healer who can help. And when we don't share, we're leaving those people in our lives to carry the burden on their own shoulders. I think another reason we, we struggle with evangelism is because we have this feeling that it's, well, it's up to me. I got to do this. Like, it's up to me to convict people of sin. It's up to me to convert people, to get them to believe. It's up to me to bring this, this conversation right here to a close. In other words, we start feeling like every conversation you have with somebody has got to be like the used car salesman at the end of the month trying to get to the quota. Let's seal this deal. And in the middle uh, of that feeling, man, that's not really very loving, is it? That's not about loving another person. It's really probably more about trying to make ourselves feel good about ourselves. Like, if I do this, if I close this deal, then man, look how great my faith is. And instead, we're actually stuck in the same trap we were hoping to help people get out of, the same trap that says, if I am good enough, 
religiously, if I'm good enough in these ways, then God will love me. And we forget that it's not about whether I'm good enough, it's about that the lamb was good enough and about what he's done for me. And we're not trusting that. I mean, the reality is the conviction of sin isn't your job, it's not my job, it's the job of the Holy Spirit. Whether someone believes and comes to the new life, this new birth through Jesus Christ, it's not your job. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And he's already at work in the lives of the people around you before you even open your mouth. See, Jesus went walking toward them to find them. He came from heaven to earth. God took on flesh. He pursued them before they thought to respond to him. And he's pursuing the people in your lives as well. And so, trust him. Ask him to open up the opportunities for those conversations. See, Andrew and the other unnamed disciple are told, there he is, the Lamb of God, and they go and they follow him. And Jesus, we're told, turns to them and asks them this incredible question, which, man, that's such a great model for evangelism. Evangelism happens most beautifully and authentically through, through conversation and questions. He asks them the best question. What do you want? What do you really long for? See, the people in your life are longing for something. And I am confident that at the core of who they are, the thing that they're longing for most, Jesus is the answer. They may not know it yet. Because people are longing to be loved. They're longing for a sense of security to know that someone will care for them. They're longing for healing. They're longing for some sort of reconciliation. They're longing for forgiveness. They're longing for hope in the midst of uncertain times. They're longing that for someone to have control when everything else seems out of control. They're longing to have a sense of value and worth. And Jesus is absolutely the confirmation and, and the gift that gives them all of those things. And so Jesus asks them, what do you want? And they respond, where are you staying? Feels kind of like a change of subject, doesn't it? But it's not. Because they said, Rabbi. In other words, they recognize you're the teacher. At least. We, don't, we don't fully understand who you are, but man, you've got something that we desperately need. So where are you staying? Because we want to be with you. Because you've got something that we need. Can we stay with you? And Jesus says, yeah, come on. Come and see. Come spend time with me. Come enter into relationship with me. I love this because Jesus does not wrap up evangelism in one neat, tidy conversation. He practices evangelism in the context of an, a relationship where over time he unfolds the truths of who God is. Over time he unfolds what God wants for their life and wants to do for them. And then as he unfolds those truths, they start to, to realize the incredible nature of what's happened and they can't help but to share. Just like when you saw the most amazing vault of your life in the Olympic Games. Just like when you had the most amazing meal you've ever tasted and you can't help but to tell everybody else about it. They tasted. And Andrew couldn't help but to tell his brother, Peter. See, it may be difficult for us to talk about what Jesus is doing because we haven't experienced it or aren't experiencing it in our own lives. The incredible joy of living in, in the freedom of surrender, of having your sins and your failure taken away by the Lamb of God. Come to him. See what he wants to do for you. And then you too will talk naturally and simply and profoundly with others about what Jesus has done. I have a dart, dartinet lived in a, in a tract home that was built just after World War II out in the potato fields on Long Island. And like all of her neighbors in that day, she didn't have a, a dryer for her clothes. So she would wash her clothes and then she'd go to the backyard and she'd hang them out on the clothesline. And as she was out there one day, she noticed one of her neighbors. And she went over and she had a, a strong Southern accent, which I'm not going to try to emulate. And she just said to her neighbor, how about a nice cold Coca-Cola? Her neighbor, Norma, Norma Levison, accepted this gesture of hospitality and they entered into a relationship together. 
And the two women began to just talk about every part of life, including Jesus. And within a matter of months, Norma had made a commitment to Christ which would last a lifetime with this deep, vibrant, durable faith which she would then turn and pass to her children and to their children and to other friends and others in her life. See, evangelism doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as inviting someone to have a Coke, beginning a conversation, talking naturally as we talk about gold medal performances in the Olympics about the Lamb of God. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, who meets us in our failure and meets us in our longing to give us new life. Look, the Lamb of God, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. <laughs> thank you that you have pursued us before we have ever thought to pursue you. We thank you that your love for us is not dependent on us being good enough, but on the perfection and the beauty of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we experience more and more the joy and the freedom of what he has done for us, that we could naturally, boldly, confidently proclaim to others the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, open up opportunities in our lives. We can picture people in our life who don't know you, who are struggling in so many ways, Lord, give us an awareness of the opportunities and the freedom to share naturally, to point to Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen. As we prepare our hearts to receive the body and blood of